Lecture 13, on Ethics, Contemporary Moral Problems. Stealing, Applied Ethics 5. Our text begins this chapter with the divine command, Thou shalt not steal. This command, typically listed as the seventh or eighth of the Ten Commandments, depending on the religious tradition of the text being consulted, appears simple and straightforward, though its meaning does not enjoy consensus among all religious scholars. But that theological difficulty aside, this command, or rule, seems popularly endorsed enough to warrant analysis in this course of study. 1. Stealing, an introduction, as our text says, the commandment, thou shalt not steal, is absolutist in nature, that is, under no circumstances is it ever morally permissible to do so. Partially due to the widespread adoption of Abrahamic religions, such as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all over the world, social customs have developed such that this moral rule is widely accepted and uncontroversial to many people. Our text anticipates that we would not be surprised if we learned of someone being incarcerated as punishment for stealing. Even though most may agree that stealing is morally wrong, there are some punishments that may surprise us. For example, under Article 201 of Iran's Islamic Penal Code, thieves can have their four fingers amputated on their first offense as punishment for stealing. The extreme nature of this religiously motivated punishment speaks to the absolutist nature of some forms of religious thought. However, the emphasis of this chapter isn't the punishment appropriate to thieves, rather, the emphasis is the analysis of the morality of stealing through the ethical lenses of Kantian ethics, utilitarianism, and Aristotelian virtue ethics. 2. Defining stealing, our text begins this section with a tentative definition for stealing, namely, the taking of another person's property without their permission. Though this definition seems appropriate initially, in true philosophical fashion, our text proposes hypothetical scenarios that may serve as counter-examples to this proposed definition. For example, if someone says you can have whatever you want from their house when they're intentionally intoxicated or drugged beyond their knowledge, then taking their possessions may constitute stealing despite having received their permission. A second example, Though not identical to our texts, if a casino continuously provides free alcohol to gambling patrons, as they often do, and the patrons drink beyond their capacities, as they often do, could the casino be accused of stealing the patrons' money even though they entered the casino with the intention of gambling of their own free will? Some might say so, but others will maintain that the patrons know what they are doing when they enter a casino and what is likely to happen. Beating the house is statistically difficult and free drinks are a part of the motivation in the first place. As for the intoxicated friend, questions of proper consent may salvage the tentative definition. However, the question of what constitutes property may also be an issue for this definition. For example, though this is somewhat different from the example given in our text, I once had a colleague who confessed to me that they would intentionally refrain from using the restroom before work or during lunch breaks because they would rather be getting paid for it than doing it on their own time. It was one of the few ways available to them to stick it to the man, as it were, and, due to their dissatisfaction with our employer, this was actually important to them. Now, would this be considered stealing? From the perspective of the employer, perhaps so. Another example our text gives is reminiscent of a controversy that transpired years ago involving Carlos Mencia when he was called out by Joe Rogan for stealing comedy bits from other comedians. Are those jokes property? Perhaps intellectual property, but it is not clearly the morally wrong type of stealing we are talking about when considered outside the realm of professional comedy. Indeed, how many times has a classmate repeated a joke aloud to the class that you shared with them in secret, or under your breath? and then accepted credit for it. It is indeed frustrating, however, in this context, is it stealing, in the moral sense? At any rate, if our initial tentative definition of stealing is to be retained, our conception of property must be rather broad. 3. Kantian Ethics and Stealing In this section our text devotes a considerable amount of time to explaining how Kant intends for us to utilize the categorical imperative. I, however, will take for granted that you have read this chapter, chapter 2, and listen to lecture 3. The first example our text has us consider is that of a thief stealing a toy from a child when the parents' backs are turned. The thief's actions are antithetical to the first formulation of the categorical imperative since, the maxim, 
Take other people's property whenever you feel like doing so renders the concept of property meaningless and thus leads to a contradiction. Having led to a contradiction, we are justified in positing the maxim of, don't take other people's property whenever you feel like doing so, as a moral law. Our text goes on to examine more detailed maxims, pointing out that adding enough specifics leads to a hack of the universalizability principle of the categorical imperative, that goes beyond what Kant intended for application. All I will say here is that the maxims expressed in our actions must be universalizable in the proper sense, that is, they must be able to apply to everyone in the same way. Alastair McIntyre explains this hack as follows, all I need to do is to characterize the proposed action in such a way that the maxim will permit me to do what I want while prohibiting others from doing what would nullify the action if universalized. Since these McIntyre-style worries appear to be strawman objections, that is, objections to a weaker theory that are claimed to be objections to the actual theory, we will not spend as much time examining them as our text does. What is more difficult for Kant's theory is the application of the second formulation, also called the formula of humanity. Recall that the second formulation states that we should so act that we use humanity, in our own persons as well as in the persons of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. When we consider stealing a loaf of bread from a small, privately owned bakery that is owned and operated by an individual baker, the second formulation of the categorical imperative is easily applicable. However, when we consider stealing a loaf of bread from an ethically questionable major supermarket like Walmart, it's not clear that anyone is being treated as a means to an end, rendering the theft as an apparently victimless crime. Even the fact that large corporations are legally considered persons doesn't seem to add much moral bite to this example, nor does it seem to improve the applicability of the second formulation in any meaningful way. And yet, according to the second formulation, it is still morally wrong. At any rate, it would be useful to practice applying the formulations of the categorical imperative to real-world examples of theft on your own. As a point of departure for this individual study, consider the recent non-fungible token scam perpetrated by adult film star Lana Rhodes. Rhodes launched what she led investors to believe was a legitimate crypto investment opportunity that would appreciate in value before abandoning the project taking with her $1.5 million worth of investors' money. Perhaps if she had framed the project as a digital artwork sale instead of calling it a valuable investment and promising to increase its value over time with other incentives she never delivered, then she wouldn't be at the center of this controversy. If we examine this example through Kant's ethical lens, we can see that road scam fails the universalizability principle for the same reasons as the false promises example in Lecture 3. It also seems to fail the second formulation of the categorical imperative since she used her fans and investors as mere means to the end of making money. To treat them as not mere means but also ends in themselves, she would have had to stick with the project and at least attempt to deliver on the promises she had made, but she didn't. Since her act fails the first and second formulations of the categorical imperative, it also fails the third, so-called, kingdom of ends formulation, and is, therefore, on this view, morally wrong. For act and preference utilitarianism on stealing, as our text notes, with regard to the moral characterization of stealing, the question facing Kantian ethics is, can stealing ever be justified? However, when we consider utilitarianism, a view that holds that whatever act provides the greatest good for the greatest number of people is a morally good one, the question becomes, is stealing too often morally permissible? Indeed, if we reconsider the previous example of stealing a loaf of bread from Walmart to feed one starving family, it seems that no one is significantly harmed but a family is significantly helped. Therefore, unlike the result of the Kantian moral calculus, from the utilitarian point of view, stealing the loaf of bread would be a morally good act. Our text has us consider numerous examples, such as stealing Christmas gifts from a large company for one's family, illegally downloading music, stealing one dollar from every bank account in the world, and stealing a car for a fun night out with friends but returning it with a full tank of gas before the owner even notices that it's gone. In every example given, the consequences produce more good for more people than bad, suggesting that, on this view, not stealing would be morally wrong. This is a counterintuitive result for a moral theory 
but an act utilitarian can argue that this is only a theoretical difficulty because in the actual application of the theory, we cannot know for certain what the consequences of our actions will be. Therefore, we can use common sense rules of thumb to determine that some illegal activities ought to be avoided when there is a real potential for harm to ensue. This rule of thumb approach can be applied to each of the examples given earlier to show why, in actual application, the utilitarian need not always steal in those types of situations. For example, had the parents who stole presents for their children been caught, it could have potentially caused them legal financial penalties, or landed them in jail, and ruined Christmas. However, there is still the worry that such rules of thumb may still not be enough to save utilitarianism from too liberally allowing instances of morally justifiable stealing. Act and preference utilitarians may retort that considering the potential psychological pains to victims may be enough to determine when stealing is unjustifiable. For example, stealing a few products from a major corporation is unlikely to cause anyone any serious psychological harm, but it is impossible to know if an object stolen from an individual has immense sentimental value to them. So, if utilitarians factor that into their moral calculus, they will see that there is no way of knowing that the act will produce greater good than harm, thus leading to a more acceptable number of morally justifiable instances of stealing. However, this can lead some to a kind of slippery slope concern that may not be fallacious. The concern is that, over time, people will become increasingly less sensitive to the consequences of stealing to the point that they can no longer empathize with victims sufficiently for their moral calculus to remain effective. Indeed, over time, people can become desensitized. However, as it was with Kantian ethics, it would behove you to come up with your own cases for the application of this theory to ensure that you understand, and can argue for, cases that would warrant moral support or criticism for stealing. 5. Rule Utilitarianism on Stealing Mill's rule utilitarianism has some helpful features that are absent in the act and preference varieties. Recall that Mill's view allows for the establishment of rules that would potentially provide the greatest good for the greatest number of people. A rule against stealing could reasonably be included in the set that provides the best consequences for the most people. Furthermore, the best set of rules may also allocate resources to social support for the less fortunate, potentially avoiding circumstances that could lead to the stolen Christmas gift example. Our text has us consider the objection that the best set of rules may also allow for stealing, when necessary, thus distinguishing between good and bad stealing. However, it's also not clear that, under the best set of rules, stealing would ever be necessary. Though this feature of Mill's view seems helpful in reducing the instances in which stealing would be morally permissible, it only takes some of the edge off the issue. Another feature of Mill's view that seems helpful is the harm principle, which, as you may recall, states that, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community, against his will, is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. If the harm principle were operative in the development of our rule set, then it seems as though we could justify a full ban on stealing from private citizens, which is perhaps the most helpful feature of this theory, at least for this issue. However, there is still the issue of stealing from businesses, which vary in size, wealth, and power, so our rules regarding the moral characterization of stealing from businesses will need as many qualifications as there are features of businesses that are relevant to our intuitions regarding the moral permissibility of stealing from them. Developing such a set of rules just for the moral permissibility of stealing from businesses would indeed be a daunting task if it is to be completely comprehensive. For example, besides the annual earnings of the business and the number of locations or employees, what other features of the business should be considered when determining whether it is morally permissible to steal from them? Should the business's ethics play a factor in our moral calculus? Try thinking about what features, of which businesses, would make it moral to steal from them, and under what circumstances, from a rule utilitarian point of view. 6. Virtue ethics on stealing According to Aristotle, becoming virtuous requires a lifelong pursuit of wisdom and other moral knowledge. The virtue ethics theory doesn't give a list of acts to be avoided, but it does tell us what vices ought to be. Acts will be morally impermissible if they result from those vices. Contrarily, acts that result from virtues will be morally good. So, on this view, 
there is no hard stop answer to the question, is stealing morally wrong? It will vary with the motivations and character of the person stealing. It is a hindrance that this theory requires us to develop our characters before we can recognize and separate moral from immoral acts, but that just might be the way life is. It would be nice if a theory could give us specific guidance, but life is hard, and things are complicated. So, the actual answer, in the end, may be that we just need to do our due diligence to become good people. Our text has us reconsider stealing a loaf of bread from a supermarket, but doing so with the intention of giving it to a starving homeless woman. If this act is performed out of righteousness, then it is good. If it is performed for the sake of self-serving flattery or out of spitefulness for the store, then it is bad since the motivations were vicious. Our text asks a peculiar question regarding this explanation, namely, how are we to determine if our stealing a loaf of bread would be based on righteous and generous character dispositions, or reflect rashness and self-serving flattery? Perhaps I am overestimating most people, but I think, generally, we know our own motivations. People definitely do exist who are narcissistic and believe themselves to be good people despite doing things out of self-serving flattery. But it still seems like they would know why they are doing what they are doing, despite telling themselves that they are great people the whole time they are doing it. I could definitely be wrong in my assessment, but in the end, the difficulties that face this theory may only exist because it is so realistic. Another possible route to discovering what acts are virtuous, is to look to actions of virtuous people. Perhaps we will be successful if we look to St. Augustine, as our text suggests, who was completely averse to stealing. Bertrand Russell once gave an account of Augustine's youth, saying, It appears that, with some companions of his own age, he despoiled a neighbor's pear tree, although he was not hungry, and his parents had better pears at home. He continued throughout his life to consider this an act of almost incredible wickedness. It would not have been so bad if he had been hungry or had no other means of getting pears, but, as it was, the act was one of pure mischief, inspired by the love of wickedness for its own sake. Augustine's harsh self-assessment and willingness to recharacterize his acts had his motivations been different is evidence of his eventual recognition of virtue and improved moral reasoning later in life, perhaps making him, in the end, a good role model for virtuous behavior. However, our text points out that we may be mistaken when identifying virtuous role models, and, if those role models ranged from Robin Hood to fictional pirates, the differences we would exhibit would likely be increasingly more vicious. However, the bitter pill we would likely receive from Aristotle is that we need to develop practical reason. Until we've dedicated ourselves to reason and virtue, lived and learned, we may not be able to easily recognize who are the virtuous people, nor what the virtuous actions are. 7. Metaethics and Stealing Though our text issues some requirements from the Assessment and Qualifications Alliance, AQA, in this section, I will note that this course is unaffiliated, and I determine all of the requirements. In this course of study, while it is beneficial to relate metaethical theories to applied ethical issues, you will not be tested on your ability to do so. However, you may be tested on your knowledge of metaethical theories. The first combination of metaethical theories considered by our text is cognitivism and realism. In this combination, moral claims regarding stealing are realist, in that, they are, as a matter of fact, either true or false in the real world, independent of what we might think about them. They are cognitivist in that these claims are beliefs held by those who espouse them. As our text says, for the utilitarian, moral claims regarding the ethical acceptability of individual actions will be made true by natural properties such as pleasure, happiness, or preference satisfaction. For the intuitionist, the non-natural property of goodness will make some of our moral claims regarding stealing true. Theories that are cognitivist but anti-realist, such as the moral error theory, maintain that moral facts are indeed beliefs that people possess but are not facts of the real world. Non-cognitivist and anti-realist theories, such as emotivism and prescriptivism, are non-cognitivist in that they see moral claims as mere emotional attitudes toward presumably moral acts or merely representing what someone would recommend with regard to supposedly moral situations. In short, on these views, moral claims do not represent features, or commentaries on features, of the real world, but merely someone's opinion regarding correct action. 
As our text excellently articulates, according to the non-cognitivist anti-realist, we cannot criticize a thief as morally wrong when using this argument. However, if we adopt prescriptivism, we might at least be able to criticize the thief for inconsistency if she speaks of the general wrongness of stealing whilst defending the rightness of stealing in her case. Despite this, one big worry for those interested in adopting a view like emotivism or prescriptivism is that it cheapens and eliminates the value of moral debate over the moral rightness of stealing, since we cannot defend our ethical claims as being genuinely true or false in the way that realists seek to do and in the way that most people would wish to. 8. Summary. As our text concludes, many will want to avoid an absolute moral view regarding the unacceptability of stealing, the kind of view that Kant might be thought to defend. Neither utilitarianism nor virtue ethics offer an absolute prohibition against stealing, but each has their own problems. In terms of showing your understanding of these issues, applying normative theories to your own variety of cases is a tactic that may best enable you to write with confidence about the various nuanced issues afflicting each theory. 9. Questions and tasks. Of the 10 questions asked in our text, please at least answer the following questions before next time. 1. Can you create your own satisfactory definition of stealing? 2. How does the definition you arrived at in, 1, fit with the idea of stealing ideas? 3. Is an absolute prohibition against stealing defensible? Why or why not? 4. Would the best set of rules for promoting the greatest good for the greatest number contain a rule absolutely prohibiting stealing?